Welcome, everyone. My name is Tom Williams, and I'm co-host for the Partnership for a Compassionate Louisville. We're not as good of hosts as we would like to be today, because apparently we're such a popular event that we have more people than tables. So if, if everyone will try to bear with us and, and find a spot, I know our servers are being very helpful about uh, about pulling things together and, and helping people uh, find some food. But before we, st we start the program, I want to acknowledge a few special guests. Um, first of all, we'd like to acknowledge our delegation from Winnipeg, Canada, that's down here in the front. They, they say when the student is ready, the teacher will come. Well, the teacher has come for us. We've learned so much from our group from Winnipeg, and we are really looking forward to the possibility of going to visit and see all of the work they've done with Compassion in their healthcare system and the Human Rights Museum that they're building and so many things that they do in the heart of the continent. So we're very excited to have them. We also want to acknowledge um, our friends from Seattle, Washington, Yafa Maritz, and John Raymer and Andrew Himes down here. Uh, Seattle and their group is our big brother in the compassion movement. None of what we did on the organizational level would have been possible without the help of Seattle. Um, and, and we will always be indebted to them and we're always thankful for that relationship. We have good friends here from Springfield, Illinois, who share Abraham Lincoln with us. Um, we had a nice visit with them, and they're trying to organize their city as well. We have a dear friend from Charlotte, North Carolina, Mr. Will Terry, who's here trying to organize Charlotte and is making good friends. Uh, we have friends in from the Contemplative Dialogue Group from um, Edmonton, uh, Canada. Excuse me, too many Canadian sp places. A dear friend, Olivia McAvore, who's sitting with the mayor from um, Vancouver, who is an expert in human resources and compassion. So we, we are so very excited to have so many um, different folks here from, from very many different places. Um, the agenda does not call for a blessing, but if you don't mind, I will give a blessing and then a minute, and then perhaps we'll um, have the mayor come up and speak. So if you'll um, bow your heads. Heavenly Father, um, source of all compassion, we ask that you uh, bless this food, that you bless the water, that you bless the air that we breathe, that you bless the community that we live in, and that you spread your message to all. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you. We'll be back in a moment. Well, everyone, please, uh, please continue to eat. It's nice to have difficulties with the, the lunch at a compassion gathering because it gives us opportunity to practice our compassion, doesn't it? Yeah. And, um, and I owe a couple, uh, some forgiveness to some of our other guests that are in town. We have a guest from Charleston, South Carolina, who's back there with us. Uh, we have Sandy from Southern California and the Conference of World Religions is here with us as well. And then last but not least is uh, Dr. Robin Youngson, who is in from New Zealand and spending the whole week uh, with us in Louisville to talk about compassion in healthcare, and he has a really profound talk that he's going to offer tonight at the Jewish Heart and uh, Lung Center at 7 o'clock. So now it's my privilege to uh, introduce our 50th mayor, Mayor Greg Fisher. Uh, he is almost a man that needs no introduction, but I'll, I'll go ahead and give, it, give one. And that is, um, I've never met an elected official that has less concern or less need for credit. He is really a man that's all about process. He's a man about inclusion, including everyone. Uh, and, and the other day I heard him say it, and it was really a profound statement for me to hear, and that was that government is about helping people achieve their human potential, everyone to achieve their human potential. It was so profound when I heard it that I wrote it down, and I probably didn't recite it correctly, so maybe I'll ask him to, to, to say it. But uh, he's he's been a, a tremendous and powerful leader, and obviously for as co-hosts for the Partnership for Compassionate Louisville, none of this that we did in this city and that we've been able to accomplish over the last year would have been possible without our mayor creating this space 
in giving people permission and an invitation to talk about compassion, compassion in business, compassion with children, compassion in the court system, compassion in all of its varied forms. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mayor Fisher. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be with you, and we've welcomed all of our guests. How about if we also thank the people that are serving us here today? They're doing a great job. You guys are professionals. We appreciate that very much. Well, what a great uh, event here. And anybody that knows me knows that the Festival of Faith is one of my favorite events here in Louisville. It's something I brag about on our city as I travel around the world. Not many people have a Festival of Faiths, and you are experiencing really an extraordinary gathering of people from all over the world that look at the world in many, many different ways. And we've got a lot of great festivals here in Louisville. We're the, we were appointed Festival City of North America, so we've got a little two-week festival for a two-minute horse race called the Kentucky Derby Festival, and then we have the Idea Festival, and our Give a Day week that I'll talk a little bit about. So when we talk about the Festival of Faith being right up there at the top, you know this is just an outstanding gathering for us. And how, how many of you all are not from Louisville? Can I see a show of hands here so I understand the crowd a little bit? Okay, so probably about 40% of the crowd. Thank you. This uh, festival really would not be having the kind of momentum that it has without Christy Brown. And Christy's over here. She's very low-key, so she won't act like she's uh, been responsible for all this, but Christy sitting over there with actually two other people have had a lot to do with this festival, and that's my uh, mom, Mary Lee, and my dad, George, so that's a very nice looking three, three folks over there. Good job. All right. But it's really been a legion of champions. Uh, it seems like we've, as we've come upon this word compassion and use it more, it's really picking up, up momentum as well, but it's 18 years now the festival has been in place, so it gets bigger and better every year here, and to me it really represents the heart of Louisville, and I hope as you all from out of town are here, you see the heart of Louisville and what we have going on here. Our community, it's a family that we call, I was realized the other day I was talking to a family business gathering, and it struck me that really right now what I'm doing is running the family business. The family just happens to be called Louisville, and we're all connected in our family. And just sometimes, like family businesses, have like a strange cousin or a brother that's a little out of line sometimes, but we still love them. You know, cities are much the same way. We all invest in each other through taxes, and we all got to rise each other up as well. So it's good to be running a family business. Our family here in Louisville has a history of recognizing our common heart as well. And it was probably best exemplified a little bit over 50 years ago, and a couple of you all have heard this story before, but it happened here in downtown Louisville when our famous monk from the Abbey of Gethsemane named Thomas Merton had his famous epiphany. And it was near the interse intersection of what's now known as Fourth and Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, in 1958, was known as Walnut Street. But you all may know the champ, the Louisville Lip, is obviously from our city, so it was named for Muhammad Ali. And, and that's another story, how the biggest, baddest athlete of the 20th century could turn into the biggest, baddest humanitarian of the 20th century as well. Not many people use a platform to do that, but the champ certainly had, and we're proud to have a street named after him. There we go for Muhammad Ali. And he's still doing pretty good. He's 70 years old and he participates in a lot of interfaith activity all over the world in our city as well. So you can picture this, 1958, Thomas Merton was standing at the intersection of Fourth and Muhammad Ali, and at that time it was the hustling, bustling shopping district of our city. And he, like many folks, is always trying to figure out what this big universe is all about. And then he was struck that he suddenly saw in everyone the way that God looks at us all together. In his epiphany, he said that if we could all see each other that way, there would be no more war, no anger, no division. 
but he thought it was impossible, that there's no way of telling people that here we are, all the people walking around, shining like the sun. So think of that image of people and everybody that you're sitting with right now with a spotlight hitting right on their foreheads and face, shining like the sun. So we, we may not be able to really appreciate the full dimensions of Thomas Merton's view, but I would put forth that the Festival of Faiths is a way, just one way, that Louisville demonstrates again and again that we do see the light shining in each other. Not just those that are here today, but for all of us that walk this earth as well. And I can tell you that as the mayor of this great city, I've been welcomed in temples and mosques and churches, and I've been constantly reminded by what I already knew, and that's we're all the same. We're all the same. And that was a value that I grew up in my family, with my family. We all have the same desires. We all want the same thing for our families. And we have many, many faiths, but we share one heart. And I was with a religious leader the other day, and he was talking about his faith, and everybody should come to his faith. And I said, I appreciate that, Rev. And you should work hard for your faith. But my job as the mayor of the city is to work for that one heart for our community. I grew up in the Catholic Church. I was married in the Greek Orthodox Church, and I've heard the story of Thomas Merton's, or I've shared the story of Thomas Merton's Louisville Epiphany with people of many different faiths. And in fact, the Dalai Lama is going to be visiting us next May, and I'm sure we'll be discussing his relationship with Thomas Merton as well. So think about this. When a Catholic guy who attends a Greek Orthodox Church can discuss with the Dalai Lama the epiphany of a Trappist monk on a street named for an Islamic boxer. I think that really says something about our great uh, country, but about our great city of Louisville as well. So we're proud of that. Now, it's hard to believe that it's already been a year since we officially became a charter of Compassion City. And I had the pleasure a year ago of standing before a Festival of Faith breakfast group in announcing the creation of Compassionate Louisville, a partnership for a Compassionate Louisville. You've heard from Tom Williams. Tom does a great job. He's one of the co-hosts of the partnership. They don't call themselves chairs. They feel like that's too officious. So we're hosting. So it's Tom Williams and Sadiqa Reynolds, who's our chief for community building inside of Metro Louisville. And they don't just chair it, they host it. And they're facilitating the compassionate side of bringing together all of these activities in our city that we already have. And it's too big a job for just two people, so we were happy to welcome Brenda Frank uh, just this past week as an additional co-host for Compassionate Louisville. So, if Brenda, if you're here somewhere, thank you for everything that you're doing as well. Here she is, waving over it in the corner. Good job, Brenda. So even though it's just been a year since we announced the partnership, it's really gratifying to see the progress that we made. Last year, at this point, to many people, the project seemed rather theoretical. Uh, yes, they knew that we were the largest city to adopt the Charter of Compassion, and yes, they knew that Spalding University was talking about becoming a compassionate university. Eric Cowan of the Compassion Action Network in Seattle called us a hotbed of compassion. But I don't think we fully realized how quickly this would become part of our city's identity. Things started happening fast. Spalding, under Tory Merton McClure's leadership, and President McClure is with us here today, became the first compassionate university. Great job, Spalding. <laughs> Louisville was named the international model city of compassion. And then many other groups inside of the city are leading as well. And it's really interesting to see how they bubble up by themselves. A group of seniors, 80 to 90 year olds, at Trayton Oak Towers told us about the compassion circles they have at their living facility. The elementary school kids at the Chance School, the Muhammad Ali Center, compassion 
is breaking out all over town. And at least eight other organizations in town have adopted resolutions with the Charter for Compassion joining this effort. I find, as mayor, this is the number one thing when I talk to crowds about that they nod their head about compassion. More than economic development, more than sustainability, more than public safety, it's uncovering already what's inside of people's hearts. We manifested this as a community last May with the mayor's give a day week of service. It's easy to flap the lips, right? We say we watch the action. How can we bring compassion to life in a city? Many different ways, but one way we do that is through service. So the Mayor's Give a Day Week was a huge success last April. We counted more than 90,000 volunteer and acts of kindness in our city. Now at that time, when you're mayor, you can take a lot of license. So I proclaimed us the most compassionate city in the world, because that's one of the great things about mayor. You can proclaim most anything and people go with it. And then I challenged other cities. I said, prove us wrong. You know, show us that you're more compassionate than we are. So we've talked about our friends from Seattle that are here. Seattle, certainly, I could tell they were irritated when we said that we were the most compassionate city. It was like, how dare you suggest that you're more compassionate than, than Seattle? And I said, well, game on. So Seattle recently took us up on that challenge. They converted our number, number of volunteers and acts of kindness to an estimated 100,000 man hours, which I have to say, and this isn't, I have to say I thought it was an extraordinarily uncompassionate <laughs> assumption. <laughs> if you just estimate our 90,000 people at two hours apiece, that's 180,000 hours. But there's a limit to how much you're going to quibble and still claim to be compassionate, so I'm going to let it slide. So they went on their journey. They set out to beat us and tallied 150,000 hours of compassion over a month. So I guess that we both get to claim a victory of sorts, and that's good because when it comes to compassion, everybody, and a compassion challenge, everybody wins. So I say, good job, Seattle. <laughs> So when I, as I said, when I first talk, started talking about compassion, I think a lot of people were really skeptical. As mayor, they expect me to talk about a lot of things, which they expect me to talk about jobs, which I do a lot. I'm a business guy, an entrepreneur that just happens to be mayor, so they expect me to talk about cutting bureaucracy, making government work more efficiently, and I also do that a lot. And they weren't even too surprised when I started talking about education and becoming a healthier city which I also do a lot, because they realize that those are vital parts of improving our economy and certainly our quality of life here in the Ville. But compassion did surprise a lot of people. And I can still remember my political advisors, not all of them, but some of them saying, do not talk about compassion. Don't talk about Thomas Merton and epiphanies. It makes you sound weak and out of touch. People don't want their politicians to be weak. Well, I said, first off, I am not a politician. I'm a public servant, and compassion and love are threads that bind each and every one of us. And it's one way for us to embrace the future together and go about the good work that we need to do. Uh, we are one community, we are one city, we are one family, so our elected officials should talk about things like compassion and love and how we help each other. How are we going to win in the game of life if we're not supporting each other? And as Tom talked about before, really the job, and we take a look at a higher level of abstraction of government, should be able to help people realize their human potential. Some people don't need any help. Other people do need help, and we're in this together. So how do we help each other? And compassion surely is one of those ways we can express that. So slowly, I've watched the skepticism melt away, the skepticism about me and as an elected official talking about compassion. And I can say now, every day, I have people come up to me and say, let me tell you about what our organization 
is doing to become more compassionate. So it's been very interesting how this has rolled along, both locally and now on a national level. I have mayors from Houston to Cambridge, Massachusetts, call me and say, tell me about this compassion thing that you've got going on in your city. And when I accepted an award on behalf of our city as the most livable city, big city in the country, mainly because of our work around compassion, I challenged all the other 200 mayors that were present to be this. Let's start a brush fire of compassion all around this country. And they said, game on, let's go. So the beautiful thing is, of course, that hospitality and compassion were already present in our city. And I think this is really the key for all of us. It's almost like people need permission to talk about things that for some are a little bit soft or not so direct. But there's big hearts and there's big souls inside of everybody. And some folks just need a little bit of help getting it out. But it's beautiful when you see it come out and people feel liberated when the discussions start and the actions start flowing forth in the community. Locally, as I said, we were already there with hospitality and compassion. It was very much like having a, a beautiful tree, but it's in a, a field that is a little bit overgrown. So in a small way, our festival of faiths, and maybe myself in a small way, we've been able to cut back some of that overgrowth around the tree and make it more visible and less choked out by the demands that really come at us every day. We call it the underbrush of daily life. So let's give it more attention. It's amazing what a little water and a middle, little sunlight will do to help us all really flourish and really thrive. So later today, we're going to plant a tree of compassion right here at the African American Heritage Center. And I predict that we'll all be amazed at how fast it grows and how quickly people come to take comfort in its strength as well when they see themselves represented by the beautiful symbol of a tree. So I really appreciate the opportunity to welcome many of you all to our city, allowing me to take a little bit of your time today. And for the assembled uh, masses here that are part of the Compassion team already, I, see, I say keep up the good work that we're all doing around the world. And I ask you to keep spreading acts of those compassion and help the people in Louisville and help people all over the world see each other shining like the sun. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. When Ari Cowan came to Louisville, he threatened to kidnap our mayor. We had to keep armed guards around him to make sure that didn't happen. So we're, we're glad he's staying here. It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, someone who was there at the start of the Charter for Compassion, uh, Dr. Joan Brown Campbell. One of the best compliments you can ever get is to have Toy Murden say she is the real McCoy. And Tori has spent some time with her and said, you have to meet this woman. She is the real McCoy. She's the real deal. Um, the Reverend Campbell was ordained a minister withstanding in two Christian de denominations, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and the American Baptist Church. Like many women in her generation, Reverend Campbell was a fir first a wife, a mother, and a com community volunteer. At the age of 50, she was ordained. She was already a leader in the ecumenical interfaith movement where she, where she gave leadership for over 30 years. Dr. Campbell is truly a first woman. In every job she held, she was the first woman to carry that responsibility. She was the first woman to be Associate Executive Director of the Greater Cleveland Council of Churches, the first woman to be the Executive Director of the U.S. Office of World Council of Churches, the first woman ordained to be the General Secretary of the National Council of Churches of Christ in the United States. And today, she is the first woman Director of Religion at the historic Chautauqua Institute. Her daughter, Jane Campbell, follows in her mother's footsteps as the first woman mayor of Cleveland. Um, Dr. Campbell is going to talk about dangerous dreams and the birth of the Charter for Compassion. Thank you. Mayor, you're a very hard act to follow. 
But let me say to you, on behalf of everybody gathered here and people that don't live in Louisville, that know what you're doing all around the world, thank you for your decision to become a compassionate city, with Seattle, of course. I have my friends sitting out there, I wouldn't dare not say that. But to have you such a strong spokesperson for compassion is a great tribute and it's a great assistance to the movement that began not that very long ago. You led the way, you offered a model for other cities, and you stepped into the unknown without all the answers and not afraid of somebody calling you a softy. And I quite admire that. You were willing to be misunderstood for the sake of compassion, because whether we want to admit it or not, compassion is always a risk because it has unknown consequences, hopefully all blessed ones, but not always an easy path. I want to tell two mayor stories just to begin uh, my part of this day's uh, adventure. It requires my telling you just a little bit about my own history and background. When I was a very young woman, it seems younger to me all the time. I think I was about 33 years old. And uh, my pastor, who happens to be in the congregation today, began strong sermons and actions in the, in the civil rights era. It was right very near to the beginning of the time that Martin Luther King came to be known. Very soon after he had given his speech, which this year we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's speech in 2013. One day, um, it was suggested that a small committee that I had been part of might think about inviting Martin Luther King to the congregation that I was part of. I went to this meeting, urged Martin Luther King, he made a statement here where he said, I've never been in a white church. I've been asked to be in black churches in Cleveland every time I've come. And I said to him, uh, my trademark being, here am I, send me. I said, well, you're welcome to come to our church. I had no idea that this congregation, whose minister had taken such a strong stand for civil rights, that this congregation would have within it people who did not, not only did they not think it was a good idea, they thought it was just about the worst idea they had ever heard. And so there ensued within the congregation a battle about whether or not Dr. King would be able to be present in the congregation. This was quite a few years ago, my friends. The decision was ultimately made by those in the congregation who had the strength to say, of course he's welcome. Some of the powers that be said, well, he will have to speak outside. That was not really very smart on their part, since had he have spoken inside, we could have only held about 400 people. The fact that he spoke outside, and I will tell you, I never did understand this, because if people didn't want it known that the congregation was doing this, having him outside seemed to me not a very smart move. <laughs> but we had probably about 2,500 people. And that congregation's life will forever and always be marked with the enormous gift of Dr. King's presence. And it's marked the history and the character of that congregation. For my own life, it created enormous complexities, having been one of the people who took leadership in this. The reason Dr. King was in town, Mayor, was because this was the year that Carl Burton Stokes was going to run for mayor of Cleveland. He was, as people know and history tells us, he became the first African-American mayor in the United States of a major American city. Our role as a congregation was to help get the vote out to make sure that, Dr. St that, that Stokes did, in fact, 
become the mayor? Well, this race for mayor in Cleveland tested both the church and the city. I will have to tell you that compassion was in short supply. There was lots of protectionism that came about as a result of Carl's race for mayor. And Carl Stokes used to say, if you care about the poor, don't just begin a hunger center. Elect a mayor who believes that the poor matter. Translated to today, he might have said, elect a mayor who will take a chance on compassion. He said, elect a mayor who's willing to risk legislative matters that will provide better housing, more jobs, better education, emergency food, and health for all of Cleveland's citizens. And that was the beginning of my own journey was through the election of Carl Stokes. I remember going to the west side of Cleveland, which at that point in time was not at all favorable to the election of Mayor Stokes. And I took my children with me. My children used to say, how can you object to something if your mother is leading the parade? And that was a little bit tough. And uh, we were not treated very well. People threw things at us and called us names. And I remember my daughter turned to me. She was, I think, about 12 years old at that point, And she said, why would anyone want to be mayor of this city when, in fact, you get treated like this? When she called me on the phone to say, mother, I've decided I'm going to accept the challenge to run for mayor of Cleveland, I reminded her of her comment and thought that she had best know the words of her own wisdom in such a situation. Well, all of this began to touch on my own memory and my own experience with compassion. I learned the hard way that compassion is more than just feelings. It's a risky response, and sometimes it's a dangerous dream. You know, it's the passion part of compassion that gets us in trouble. Without passion, not a lot would happen in life. But it's never easy. Passion drives you always, in this case, to do the best. But it always makes people nervous. It is risky, and it is not always the easiest path. The second mayor story is one about my own daughter. It was 3.30 in the morning. My daughter called me and she said, Mother, you have to come right now. I need somebody to stay with the children. And I said, all right, Mayor, I'll be there. This was how we came to address her. And um, she said, my safety director called and said that he is sitting in my driveway and that they need me immediately for a great emergency that the city is facing. There was no explanation until she got in the car of what was happening. The assumption was that she would go. The assumption was that there would be somebody to take care of the children. The assumption was that the city would respond to this tragedy and it wouldn't take time to make it convenient. There was no time for questions, only time for action. Nine children had died in a terrible fire. The questions came later. The response was immediate, unquestioning. It was a compassionate city's response and a compassionate response by a mayor who cared deeply about the city. As we seek to understand compassion, this brings me, excuse me, is it not right? The mayor's taller than I am. This brings me to a point in the speech to ask just a few moments of your time to talk a little bit about what is compassion. 
and how did the dialogue begin? Let me tell you just a little bit about Karen Armstrong, who is probably singularly responsible for the movement that's growing and blowing like the wind through our towns. She was the architect of the Charter of Compassion. Let me tell you how I got to know Karen Armstrong. She was invited to come to Chautauqua. We were going to have nine weeks of our program every Friday. We had determined that if we were going to do interfaith work at Chautauqua, we had best have a better understanding of Islam than we did. And so every Friday, we were going to discuss Islam. Karen was going to be our leader, and we were going to have an Islamic speaker every one of those nine Fridays. It was a great idea. Everybody was for it. Everybody said, yes, that's right, we must do this. The only difficulty was that the decision was made in January and February, and it came, the decision was made, and it was carried out, but it came after 9-11. And before the decision had been made to have Karen do this, 9-11 had not happened. And the enthusiasm for understanding Islam was of a totally different character after 9-11. They were probably some of Karen's most difficult nine weeks. Someone said to me, surely not at Chautauqua. Surely there's not prejudice at Chautauqua about Islam. I'd like to tell you that the answer to that is that's true. The fact of the matter is, if you remember, two things happened after 9-11. We had the most magnificent interfaith moments this country has ever had. And then we went to war. And after that, the turning against Islam became very, very strong. And any organization at that point in time trying to help understand Islam was going to face difficulty. Karen was in the heat of it. It wasn't everybody. It wasn't more than three or four people at times. But it was not an easy summer. But she was a rock, and we needed her desperately. And no matter what people said to her, her ability to be, I said to her, Karen, you are the ultimate compassionate person. She said, do you think that's what it is? I said, yes, I know that's what it is. And she helped people come around to understanding when someone stood up and said something about Islam, she said, let's just stop for a minute. Let's think about Christianity and the Crusades and the Inquisition. Let's think about the fact that in every religion, there have been times we're not proud of. In every religion, there have been people that are extremists, but we can't deny a whole religion because of the acts of some few people. And so out of that experience, when Karen was asked by the TED organization, they told her, gave her what I think was an absolutely remarkable opportunity. They said, tell us your most fond dream and we'll fund it. Now I ask you, if someone asks you that question, wouldn't you have to think a little while? What would it be that you'd say, this is my fondest dream for the world, for the well-being of humanity? Karen, like that. And somewhat out of her early experience in that time at Chautauqua, she said, my dream is for a world where compassion is central to who we are and how we behave with one another. And out of that came the writing of the Charter of Compassion. The writing itself was not an easy task. It didn't begin with the well-honed document that you now see as the Charter of Compassion. 
It began with people all over the world sending in their ideas. And two of us were assigned to take all of this, these ideas and to take what Karen is giving us and look at it. And I will tell you something. Finally, when we looked at what came from all over, we said to one another, this looks a little like a committee has written this. Let's give it back to Karen and have her put it back together with strength and poetry, which that document now has today. And just in case you haven't heard it, let me just read the beginning of the document. It reads like this. The principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious, ethical, and spiritual traditions, calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. It then, however, goes on to say, we must acknowledge that we have failed to live compassionately and that some have even increased the sum of human misery in the name of religion. I touch on that piece of it because I think that one of the most important tasks in our compassion agenda is for the world's religions to finally take their place as the religions of the world that honor each other in ways profound and deep and compassionate. The fact that religions do not honor other religions does not make us good spokespeople for compassion. And I think that perhaps it's not too much to say that it's just possible that the peace of the world depends on the religions of the world coming together and saying with one amen, this is who we are and this is what we believe. This is what Thomas Merton fought for. This is what people all over the world are beginning to say. It isn't that you can't honor the religion that you have in your heart, that the religion that you've taught your children, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the ability to say that that other person's religion and that person's religion, all of them are equal when it comes to what, how they can change human beings and how they can make for a better world. But none of them can do it alone. And nobody can do it when the only thing they're thinking about is who's going to have the most converts and who is going to be the best at what they do. In the world of religion, there should be no number one. We should, in fact, have compassionate religion as well as compassionate cities. The peace of <laughs> the peace of the world just might depend on it. Just a few closing remarks. Why do cities matter, Mayor? I believe that cities are the most important entities around the world. Cities are where the elected officials live close to people. My daughter is now the chief of staff to Senator Landro in the United States Senate. She much preferred being mayor. I said to her, what, what would you be if you, she said, I'd be mayor. I'd be mayor because when you walk out of City Hall, she said, as much as it makes you crazy at times, the fact of the matter is, they're your people. They know who you are. They know how to call you up. They know how to call you out in the middle of the night. They know you, and you know them. And in many ways, together, you have a love affair with the city. And it's probably the major public official that has that closeness to the people that put them into office. You hear their cries, you affirm their dreams, you educate their children, you care for the sick and the elderly. These are the jobs of cities. So with cities and within them, we need compassionate hospitals, compassionate schools, compassionate businesses, compassionate religious bodies, and my friends, we need a compassionate media. Truth-telling 
without getting everybody in trouble unnecessarily at all times of the day and night. And the fact of the matter is, let's go for that one. And so we say, one of the things I think we have to think about, and I would invite everybody to have this conversation, we need to think about individuals, not just famous individuals, but individuals that we know who have led compassionate lives, people who in their neighborhood are always the ones when someone says, you know that person that moved in? Uh -uh. No way, don't, don't talk to that person. This is not gonna be good news for this neighborhood. There's gonna be somebody in that neighborhood that says, excuse me, weren't you ever new in this neighborhood? Did you want somebody to think about that with you? It's easy to think about Nelson Mandela and Gandhi and Martin Luther King and the great names that come to us as compassionate examples. But what we need is to think about where are our compassionate examples. I would invite all the cities to have a contest on compassionate examples of lives that people have led that are truly compassionate. But it will mean defining compassion in deep and profound ways. Compassion often requires sacrifice. It almost always is not necessarily going to make you popular. And it means knowing the difference between your good and the common good. And so for what this city has done, for what cities will do, for cities all across the world that may begin to think of themselves in these terms, we owe a huge debt to Karen Armstrong for her dream and what I would say for what is for her sometimes a dangerous and a dream more than she had counted on. And so we give her our thanks and I would like to end today, if I could, if my musicians are here, somewhere they are, I'm gonna end with a prayer for a holiday that I know is an American holiday and I want to say to all those of you who are here who are not from this country, this was written at Chautauqua and I wrote it because I feel that it's very important that when we take a piece of music like our wonderful America the Beautiful, that we also lace it with truth. So I will read this to you and we will have our soloist sing the parts of America, America. And if you have it in front of you, you can join her in it. We are a nation blessed, O oh God, with waves of grain, majestic mountains, and fruited plains. We give thanks for your great gifts and pray for generous hearts that even in moments of undeserved suffering, we might respond with compassion to a hungry, hurting, and war-weary world. Holy God, you created us for freedom. You called us out of slavery, out of darkness, into your miraculous light. You sent among us pilgrims and prophets and peacemakers who dared to dream of an America that would be to the world sign and symbol of life and liberty and justice for all. We yearn for that America. Walk beside us and whisper that vision of hope in our ears again and again until America's flaws are perfected and liberty is laced with love and we claim the whole world as our neighbor. Merciful God, we give thanks for all who have gone before us, for all have and who continue to protect our freedom, for all who gave their full measure of devotion, presidents, poets, teachers, preachers, soldiers, pacifists, reformers, conscientious objectors. On this day of remembrance, we pray for strength and courage in our quest for peace. Remind us that the heart for peace stirs in every nation and in all people everywhere. Freedom is your gift in which we rejoice. May we tend it with care. It is ours to share. God of vision, you walk with us into the future. 
We pray for our alabaster cities stained with human tears. We pray for the day when misery will know relief, when war and bigotry are no more, and mercy will mark all our dealings with one another. We pray today for the world's cities, their people, and their leaders. God of the ages, mold us a loving people, a people who live with extravagant love, Mold us into a healing nation of people freed from fear, inspired by the outreach hand of Lady Liberty, whose tear-stained face still dares to dream of an America where peace is possible, freedom is shared, and extravagant love will be the last word. Blessings on you all. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Uh, compliments of Carmichael's bookstore. Uh, she is going to be available to sign books uh, after the session, so if you'd like to say hello. And then I'll conclude with, um, she called for examples of compassion, and I want to share one from our friends in Winnipeg. Uh, just, I guess, a month or so ago, they had a bus driver who noticed a homeless man that had no shoes, so he took off his shoes and gave it to the homeless man and, and really started a brush fire of compassion in Winnipeg and, and spoke to the mayor and it's been on CNN. And we know there's so many examples like that here in our community as well. So thanks to everyone who provides us inspiration to each other. Please have a wonderful rest of the day. Visit the booths and visit the sessions this afternoon. Thank you.